let's go ahead and talk about how we classify carbohydrates. First off, what is a carbohydrate? It's a member of a large class of naturally occurring polyhydroxy ketones and aldehydes. Poly means many. Hydroxy is hydroxyl groups, so there must be a lot of hydroxyl groups, and they have ketone or aldehyde group. So the first type is what we call a monosaccharide, also known as simple sugars. And these are carbohydrates. They have three to seven carbon atoms. The second classification is a disaccharide. A disaccharide is a carbohydrate composed of two monosaccharides. Then we have polysaccharides. These are our complex carbohydrates. This is a carbohydrate that is a polymer of many, many monosaccharide units. Here I have some carbohydrates. These are monosaccharides. So let's go ahead and define a ketose and an aldose. A ketose is a monosaccharide that contains a ketone carbonyl group. An aldose is a monosaccharide that contains an aldehyde carbonyl group. Okay, so let's look at these uh, structures here. We have glucose, ribose, galactose, and fructose. Fructose is a ketohexose. Okay, a hexose because it has one, two, three, four, five, six carbons. Hexose. And it's a ketose because it has the ketone carbonyl group. Okay, so fructose is considered a ketohexose. The rest of these are aldoses, okay? So here we have glucose. This is an aldohexose. That's because there are six carbon atoms. One, two, three, four, five, six. Ribose is an aldopentose. It has five carbons. One, two, three, four, five. And galactose is another aldohexose. Or this is an aldohexose because it has an aldehyde group. This is an aldo because it has an aldehyde group in the same here. So these have the aldehyde groups. So make sure, you don't have to memorize these formulas, but look at each one of these. Here we have an aldehyde group, then we have the each carbon is bonded to both an OH group, hydroxyl group, and a hydrogen, okay? They differ, if we look at glucose and galactose, how do they differ? They just differ in the orientation of those hydroxyl groups. They're both aldohexoses, but they differ in the orientation of the hydroxyl groups. Turns out that monosaccharides undergo many structural changes and many chemical reactions. Well, yeah, think about it. We already talked about reactions of alcohols. Look at all these OH groups. And we talked about reactions of aldehydes and reactions of ketones. So, yeah, they're going to undergo a lot of reactions. Remember what I told you in the beginning, that the reactions that we're going to look at now for these larger molecules are the same as what we studied for the smaller organic molecules. Functional groups are the same. They undergo the same types of reactions. Monosaccharides will react with each other to produce both disaccharides and polysaccharides. And again, as I said, it's the functional groups. Uh, functional groups are going to allow reactions with alcohols, lipids, which we'll talk about later, proteins, in order to form biomolecules. Again, as I said, the structures only differ in the orientation of the OH groups. And this orientation is important. It's going to affect both the physical and biochemical properties. Monosaccharides are what we call chiral molecules. And they exist mainly in cyclic forms, which we'll see a little bit later. Ah, so monosaccharides are chiral molecules. Well, okay, as I stated before, chiral compounds lack a symmetry plane 
and they exist as enantiomers. And as, as far as these carbohydrates go, they're going to exist either in a right-handed D form or a left-handed L form. As I said before, enantiomers have the same physical properties, but they rotate the plane of polarized light in equal and opposite directions. You know, we talk about enantiomers having the same physical properties, but their physiological properties differ. Back in the 60s, I believe it was, they were giving pregnant women a drug called thalidomide for morning sickness. Well, it turns out that thalidomide consists of two enantiomers, okay? And one enantiomer worked very well for morning sickness, but the other enantiomer was causing birth defects. So I think everyone has heard of the thalidomide babies. Anytime when drugs are being developed, when they're in that developmental stage, it's important that all of the enantiomers are tested. Uh, many drugs do consist of enantiomers. One enantiomer is the active ingredient, the other one is an inactive ingredient. Uh, years ago, it was much more difficult to separate enantiomers. Nowadays, it's a little easier. But in the case of the thalidomide, that was a hard lesson learned because there were many babies born with some terrible, terrible birth defects. So let's go ahead and take a look at, uh, this is called D-glyceraldehyde. And the D is the right-handed, and L-glyceraldehyde is the left-handed. Okay, so you're like, well, how do we know? Well, what you do is you look at the chiral carbon that's furthest away from the carbonyl carbon, okay? So looking at this carbon, we know it's not chiral. It has two hydrogens. And so that would leave this one here. And this is chiral. It has one, two, three, four different groups. So this is chiral. So that means it will exist as a pair of enantiomers, the D and the L. Okay, so glyceraldehyde has one chiral carbon and can exist as two enantiomers. We said that enantiomers are the same as far as their physical properties go. They do differ in their physiological properties. And how can we determine which enantiomer we're dealing with? Well, what we do is we use an instrument called a polarimeter. I'm not sure if you guys have one in the lab or not, but we can use the polarimeter to determine which enantiomer we're dealing with, okay? So anyway, it starts off, you have some light source, and it turns out the light consists of electromagnetic waves that oscillate in all planes at right angles to the direction of the light beam. So you have, you have this light, the light waves are oscillating in different directions. So here we have a polarizer. And when the light is passed through a polarizer, only the waves in one plane will get through. And this produces what we call plane polarized light. Now, when you have a solution of optically active chemicals, what will happen is this will change the plane in which the light is polarized. We see this right here um, up and down. And notice as it enters through the solution, we have a rotation here. Okay, So the plane in which the light is polarized has been changed. What happens is this angle, okay, this change, this angle right here is measured by the polarimeter. It turns out that if one enantiomer rotates the plane of light to the left, the other rotates it to the right by the same amount. Okay, so if this rotated it by 45 degrees, this particular enantiomer, okay, let's say, so this was rotated 45 degrees, 
the other enantiomer will rotate it in the opposite direction by 45 degrees. So as I said, each enantiomer of a pair will rotate the plane of the light by equal amounts, but the direction of rotation is opposite. So we say that enantiomers are optically active. Turns out that many compounds have more than one chiral carbon atom. And here's an example. Let's take a look at this structure here. And of course, this atom here, this carbon is not chiral. This one is not chiral. But each one of these, carbon 2 and carbon 3, are chiral. By the way, we number the carbons starting at the aldehyde group in this case. So that's 1, 2, 3, 4. So this is a 4 carbon carbohydrate. So here we have two chiral carbons and we see this carbon is bonded to an OH group, this group here, a hydrogen, and this whole group here, okay? And then we see that the carbon here is bonded to the aldehyde group, an OH group, a hydrogen, and this group here. So four different groups. So we have two chiral carbons in this particular compound. So again, we, what we have here is the mirror images. So this, this we call erythros. And here we have two mirror images, three else. Okay. So these Aldotetroses have two chiral carbons. So what we have is two mirror image pairs of enantiomers. We have this pair of enantiomers and this pair of enantiomers. Both are stereoisomers, but not mirror images of one another. So the erythros and the threos are not mirror images of one another. But they are diastereomers. And these are stereoisomers that are not mirror images of one another. So erythros and threos are not mirror images of each other, but they are diastereomers. And diastereomers, unlike enantiomers, have different physical properties. Remember, enantiomers have the same physical properties, but diastereomers do not. Let's take a look at D and L sugars. The aldehyde or ketone carbonyl group of a monosaccharide, as you know, is always placed on the top. So what we're going to do is draw Fischer projections. Okay. So here's a, this is called glyceraldehyde. And there is one chiral carbon, of course. And to draw the Fischer projection, what we do is we have the, chiral carbon, we draw these two lines, and this here is a chiral carbon, okay? So these horizontal bonds, remember these are three-dimensional, so the horizontal bonds are coming out of the page, and then these bonds here are going into the page, okay? So this is a Fischer projection. Let's see if we have some more of these. Let me draw another Fisher projection for you. Um, let's go ahead and I'm going to draw the D allos. This is D allos. I'm going to I'll put the um, this is the aldehyde group here, okay? And D allos has six carbons. So we have one, two, three, four, five. And then I'm going to put this group right here. So there are actually four chiral carbons. So each one of these intersections corresponds to a chiral carbon. Again, this is a Fischer 
projection. And then I'll go ahead and put the groups where they're supposed to be. And there we go. And then let's do this. These will all get hydrogens. Okay. So now let me go ahead and draw the mirror image, which would be the L allos. So again, I'll draw this. Sorry, it's really hard to control this pen. So here is my mirror image. One, two, three, four chiral carbons. And I have my okay and then here what I'm going to do is we'll put the OH's here and the hydrogens will go in the back here so we've drawn the mirror image of D allos using a Fisher projection it turns out that we can divide monosaccharides into two families. And as you just saw, we have the D and the L sugars. So here we have the glyceraldehyde that we were looking at before. And we have the two mirror images. This here is the D glyceraldehyde, the right-handed. This is the L, the left-handed, also known as dextro and Dextro is the right-handed, Levo is the left-handed, okay? And how do we know that? Well, the OH group on the chiral carbon that's further away from the carbonyl carbon, if it is on the right, then that's the D form. If it's on the left, that is the L form. So... When we have a Fisher projection or a structure like this, the D form is always going to have the hydroxyl group on the chiral carbon furthest away from the carbonyl group, and it's going to point right. The L form is going to point left. So if we look here at D allos, what we have is we have one, two, three, four chiral carbons. This is the one furthest from the carbonyl carbon. And the OH is pointing to the right. So this is the D allos. Here, we look at this, the OH is to the left. This is the L allos. Let's look at glucose. Glucose is in both a D and an L form. So again, we're looking at the chiral carbon furthest away from the carbonyl carbon and that would be this one here. The OH is on the left and this would be the L-glucose and then here again we go to this carbon here. It's the furthest one away from the aldehyde group, furthest chiral, car chiral carbon away. So uh, it's a chiral carbon. It's furthest away from the aldehyde group and the OH is on the right. This is D-glucose. So make sure that you can differentiate between the D and L forms. So let's go ahead and talk about some properties of monosaccharides. They're generally high melting white crystalline solids. They're soluble in water. Well think about all those uh, OH groups. They're insoluble in nonpolar solvents and most are sweet tasting as we know, digestible and non-toxic. Not so sure about that, right? Now, nowadays they talk about sugar being uh, very bad for you, causing you know a lot of uh, disease. But monosaccharides with five or six carbons exist in their cyclic forms. So they don't exist in their open chain forms like we've seen. They exist in their cyclic forms. So as a review, remember if we have an aldehyde or ketone and react that with an alcohol, we end up with a very unstable hemiacetal. Okay, and Remember, the hemiacetal has both a hydroxyl group and an alkoxy group on the same carbon. That's how we recognize the hemiacetal. 
Well, it turns out that when you have an aldehyde and alcohol on the same molecule, we can form a very stable cyclic hemiacetal. Remember, hemiacetals are not stable. And we talked about that in the last chapter. And if you have the aldehyde group and the OH group on the same molecule, then what will happen is this will react in such a way as to form this cyclic hemiacetal. This carbon here has both an OR group okay, and an OH group. This is a hemiacetal carbon. What happens is there's a reaction between the carbonyl and the hydroxyl groups. I can show you here um, how this is formed. So here we have some D-glucose, and this is the open chain form. So if you turn it on its side like this, remember, number the carbons, okay? The carbonyl carbon is one all the way down to six. And then what you can do is coil this group here around, okay? So similar to this. So you coil that around, so you, you put that towards the back, and then you rotate it so that this group here is above the plane. This group here is always going to be above the plane in these cyclic structures, okay? So then what will happen is the ring will close. There's a reaction between um, the carbonyl group and this OH group, okay? and the ring closes and what we end up with are these two cyclic forms okay and both of these have a hemiacetal carbon uh, right here we have carbon number one and it has both an OH group and then this OR group the rest of the ring would be uh, here we have the oxygen and then the R group. That would be like an alkoxy group, okay? Just in case you were wondering how these form. Well, there are two forms, okay? Notice that the OH group, let's take a look at carbon 3 here. It has an OH group pointing up. So notice in the ring, the OH group also points up. And then carbon number four have one pointing down, and in the ring that also points down. So you can draw this from this here. Okay, you might want to practice that. Notice how these two differ from one another. The only difference between these two structures is in this structure on carbon number one, the OH group is pointing up, and in this structure, the OH group is pointing down down. We call these anomers. One is the beta anomer and the other one is the alpha anomer. The beta will have the OH group on carbon number one pointing upwards and the alpha anomer will have the OH group pointing downwards. These are what we call a pair of anomers. And this carbon right here, carbon number one, it's a hemiacetal carbon. We also refer to it as an anomeric carbon. So what are anomers? Cyclic sugars that differ only in the positions of the substituents of carbon one, the hemiacetal carbon. An anomeric carbon is carbon number one, the hemiacetal carbon. And this was the one that was the carbonyl carbon atom. So for an aldose, that'd be carbon one, but for a ketose, that'd be carbon number two. So this is now bonded to two oxygen atoms, okay? So right here, this is bonded to this oxygen and this oxygen here. What we have here is, uh, this is fructose, and here we have the cyclic forms of D fructose, an alpha and a beta. Again, in the alpha, this OH group. Now in this case, 
the OH group is carbon number two, okay? For the aldoses, it's carbon number one. For the ketoses, carbon number two. But again, the alpha form, the OH is pointing down. And for the beta form, the OH is pointing up. Alpha and beta anomers are not enantiomers. Remember, the L and D forms of glucose are enantiomers, but the anomers are not enantiomers. So alpha and beta anomers are not considered enantiomers. If you don't believe me, go ahead and prepare models of them, and uh, you should be able to superimpose their mirror images. Okay. We've talked about enantiomers, we've talked about anomers, and you, you might want to take a good look at this. This is going to be important in a little bit when we talk about disaccharides. It turns out that crystalline glucose is entirely in its cyclic alpha form. So when you when we buy um, glucose, you know, from a chemical company for an experiment, we'll find out that the glucose is in the cyclic alpha form. But when we dissolve it in water, and what happens is an equilibrium is established. We have the cyclic alpha form, put it in water, and now we have a mixture of the alpha, the beta form, and the open chain form. Notice that when dissolved in water, most of it, 64% of it, is in the beta form. Only 36% in the alpha and 0.02% in the open chain form. What's happening is the solution of this alpha and beta glucose will undergo a gradual change in rotation and we call this mutarotation okay and this will this will go on until the ring opening and closing reactions come to this equilibrium right here so let's take a look at a few reactions of monosaccharides Remember, we know that aldehydes are oxidized to carboxylic acids. So we take some D-glucose, okay? And um, again, we're gonna have that in equilibrium uh, with the alpha, the beta form, and the open chain form. And we take a look at this. We have that aldehyde group here, okay, in the open chain form, and we know that that can be oxidized. What happens when you oxidize an aldehyde, we end up with a carboxyl group, okay? So in this case here, the hydrogen is not bonded here, okay? This is in solution as the gluconate ion, but we see this oxidation. We talk about reducing sugars. I'm not going to go into tests for reducing sugars and all of that. Uh, you'll be doing that in the lab, so you don't need to read about that for the lecture. I'm not going to ask you about the actual tests, okay? But I do want you to be able to differentiate between reducing and non-reducing sugars. It turns out, remember what we said about ketones, okay? Ketones, remember, cannot be oxidized. Why is that? That's because they don't have that available hydrogen and carbonyl carbon. So aldehydes are oxidized to carboxylic acids, but ketones are not. Well, so you would think then, well, a ketone then cannot be a reducing sugar. Well, actually, in a basic solution, ketoses are what we call reducing sugars. So here's what happens. We have this ketose here, okay? And we have basic solution. And it'll undergo this arrangement here where the carbon oxygen double bond that partially breaks here we have a hydrogen okay see the um, hydrogen here and a carbon carbon double bond forms here okay and then we see a rearrangement where 
the carbon-carbon double bond now converts to carbon-carbon single bond and we get a double bond here between the carbon and the oxygen. So basically what happens in basic solution, the ketose is converted to an aldose. Therefore, it can be oxidized just like an aldose. So in basic solution, all monosaccharides, whether aldoses or ketoses, are what we call reducing sugars. You say, wait a minute, why do we call it a reducing sugar if it's been oxidized? Remember, the substance that's being oxidized is the reducing agent, right? The substance that's being reduced is the oxidizing agent. So the reducing sugars, okay, that's the same as the reducing agent. So all monosaccharides, all of them, whether it's an aldose or a ketose, are going to be a re reducing sugars. Again, I won't get into the uh, testing and all of that. You don't have to know that for the lecture. Probably in the lab you do. But when they test for sugar, when you go for a blood test, what they're doing is uh, testing for the presence of monosaccharides or blood glucose testing, if you will. So again, all monosaccharides are reducing sugars. In other words, they can be oxidized. Let's take a look at what happens when one of these cyclic sugars, like alpha-D-glucose, is reacted with an alcohol. Well, remember, in a previous chapter, we talked about how an hemiacetal uh, can form. Not very stable, but if we have enough alcohol and an acid catalyst, this can be converted to an acetal. Remember, the acetal has two alkoxy groups bonded to the same carbon. Well, it's the same here. We can take the cyclic form of alpha-D-glucose. Remember, this is a hemiacetal carbon here. React it with some alcohol, and here's what we get. We end up with the addition of an alkoxy group that replaces the OH group. Okay, So this is similar to the acetals that we talked about where you have two alkoxy-like groups. Okay, This bond here, this bond between the, this carbon-1 and the oxygen is called a glycosidic bond. So this is important that you remember this. So you say, okay, what is a glycoside? It's a cyclic acetal formed by reaction of a monosaccharide with an alcohol. The glycosidic bond is the bond between the anomeric carbon or the hemiacetal carbon of a monosaccharide and an alkoxy group, just like I showed you. Glycosides that do not contain hemiacetal groups that establish an equilibrium with open chain forms are not reducing sugars. Okay, This here is a glycoside and it is not a reducing sugar. So now we can talk a little bit about disaccharides. Disaccharides form by the reaction of an anomeric carbon of one monosaccharide with an OH group of a second monosaccharide. So let's take a look what we have here. So again, here we have an anomeric carbon. Okay, This is also an anomeric carbon. But what's going to happen is the reaction is going to take place between one of the anomeric carbons with the OH group on a second monosaccharide. We end up with a glycosidic bond. Okay, So this bond here is a glycosidic bond that forms. So again, that's between the reaction of the anomeric or the hemiacetal carbon of one monosaccharide with the OH group of another monosaccharide. So this one here. So it'd be carbon number four. Okay, so between carbon one and four. Notice that here at this bond, this is pointing down. This is what we call an alpha glycosidic bond. Now notice this disaccharide still has a hemiacetal or anomeric carbon. 
That's going to be important in a few minutes. Before we talk about disaccharides in a little more detail, first we'll talk about some important monosaccharides. Again, I have made this statement. All monosaccharides are reducing sugars. Glucose. This is an aldohexose, a six-carbon sugar. And you should be familiar with these monosaccharides I'm going to talk about now. It's actually the final product of carbohydrate digestion, and it provides acetyl groups, which we'll talk about later, for entrance into the Krebs cycle or the citric acid cycle. Glucose is also called dextrose in the food industry. Um, also, it's blood sugar, and it's a product of plant photosynthesis, and glucose is stored as starch. In humans and animals, it's stored as glycogen, and it turns out that our cells use glucose as a source of energy. We're going to find out later that it's an intermediate in metabolism. Very, very important for producing proteins and also for lipid metabolism, the breakdown of fats. And it's a precursor for vitamin C production in plants and animals. Galactose. And we, you've already seen the structures of glucose, so I would get to know that structure. Galactose. This is an aldohexose. It's found in plant gums and pectins. Galactose is a component of lactose, known as milk sugar. It's produced from lactose during digestion. Lactose is converted to glucose to provide energy. We'll talk about that later. And galactose is synthesized from glucose to produce lactose for milk and other compounds that are needed for brain tissue. Galactose is not as sweet or as water soluble as glucose. Okay. And so here is the structure of galactose. Here we have the alpha and beta forms in equilibrium with the open chain galactose. The other monosaccharide is fructose. This is another important one. So D-fructose, most of the carbohydrates that we're going to talk about are the D-form. Okay. So D-fructose, also called levulose or fruit sugar, occurs in fruits and honey. And it happens to be one of the two monosaccharides that are combined in sucrose, which is a disaccharide. It's a six-carbon ketohexose, forms both six and five-membered rings in solution. It's sweeter than sucrose, and it is used in foods and beverages. It's also known to chelate minerals in the blood. So, of course, here is the um, structure for the cyclic alpha D form of fructose. And again, we see the alpha and the beta anomers in equilibrium with the open chain. And here are two very important aldoses that we'll talk about later, ribose and 2-deoxyribose. These are five carbon aldoses, and these are very important because ribose is present in RNA, so that'd be this one, and 2-deoxyribose is present in DNA, so more about those a little bit later. So let's go ahead and talk about some disaccharides. Okay, here we have a disaccharide. And we talked a little bit about the linkage of one disaccharide. So remember, what happens is the linkage is between carbon 1, uh, which was an anomeric carbon of one monosaccharide, with carbon 4 of the other monosaccharide. So this, again, this is pointing down. So this would be an alpha. And we say this is an alpha 1 4 acetyl link. Okay? So this is an alpha 1 4 disaccharide. It turns out there are three ways that monosaccharides can be linked. We can have the glycosidic bond in an alpha orientation, and we'll see that's in maltose. The glycosidic bond in a beta orientation, that's lactose. Or we can have a bond that connects two anomeric carbons, which would be sucrose. Let's take a look at each one of these. Let's talk about maltose. 
We find this in fermenting grains. It's also called malt sugar. It's used as a sweetener in foods and is produced during starch digestion. It can be hydrolyzed to two glucose molecules and maltose is a reducing sugar. I'll tell you why it's a reducing sugar. Here is maltose right here, okay? And, and I want you to know this about these disaccharides, okay? Um, what we have here is two alpha D glucose units that are linked together to form maltose, okay? So we have here a link a linkage between the, we have this glycosidic bond at carbon one, okay? And this links to carbon four of the other alpha D glucose molecule. Again, this is pointing down, so this is an alpha 1,4 link, okay? We definitely have an alpha 1,4 link, and we stated here that this is a reducing sugar. In order to be a reducing sugar, there must be a hemiacetal carbon, or an anomeric carbon, if you will, and there it is. So this is a reducing sugar. Now let's take a look at lactose. And lactose is called milk sugar and it makes up about two to eight percent of the solids in milk. And it's a disaccharide and it's composed of a beta D galactose monosaccharide and a beta D glucose monosaccharide. This is also a reducing sugar. So let's take a look at this. So here's our lactose, Oops. lactose, monosaccharide of beta lactose and beta glucose. So what we have here is a beta 1,4 link between carbon one of the galactose and carbon four of the glucose. And this is a beta one, it's still a 1,4 link, but it's a beta because this is pointing down, okay? So this is the beta 1,4 link, and it's a reducing sugar because we do have the hemiacetal carbon here at carbon 1. Table sugar, that's good old sucrose. And the major sources are sugar cane and sugar beets. And if we were to hydrolyze a molecule of sucrose, we would end up with one molecule of D-glucose and one molecule of D-fructose. So it turns out that sucrose is not a reducing sugar. So the link here, this link between these two monosaccharides is between the two hemiacetal carbons, the two anomeric carbons. We call this a 1,2 anomeric link. This is the glucose, so carbon number one. And this is fructose, so that anomeric carbon is carbon number two. So what we have is a 1,2 anomeric link. And sucrose is not a reducing sugar because there is no available anomeric or hemiacetal carbon. Okay, so I want you to know these three disaccharides, I will ask about them and about the linkages on the exam. So now we can talk about the important polysaccharides. So starch, that's a polymer of glucose, and the glucose units are joined by alpha 1,4 links. It's fully digestible and essential in the human diet. It's digested mainly in the small intestine insoluble in water, digested by hydrolysis, only present in plant material. The major sources, of course, are beans, wheat, rice, and potatoes. And two forms of starch, we have amylose, which is one. And amylose is found in plants, especially in the seeds. Its common sources, again, are beans, grains, like wheat and rice, and potatoes. Accounts for about 20% of starch. Here is the, you can see the linkages for amylose, but the chains are about several hundred to a thousand units long. And between the units we have an alpha 1,4 link 
Okay, so we see these alpha 1,4 linkages here. And this results in a flexible chain that coils into a helix. It's soluble in hot water, hydrolyzed to glucose in animals and by alpha amylase in saliva and in the small intestine. And this supplies glucose for use in meta metabolism or for energy storage. The next is amylopectin. This is 80% starch found in plants, especially in the seeds, common sources of beans, grains, like wheat and rice and potatoes. As I said, um, it accounts for about 80% of starch. The chains are several hundred to a thousand units long. We have alpha-1,4 linkages between units, as we see here. And then we have alpha-1,6 linkages between units, and this results in branching from the chain. There are multiple branches that occur in amylopectin. It's insoluble in hot water. The molecular weight of amylopectin molecules is up to 200 million. Ideal glucose storage molecule, it's large and soluble and compact due to branching. It supplies energy for seed germination and early growth, hydrolyzed to glucose in animals by amylase in, small, in the small intestine. And this supplies glucose for use in metabolism or for energy storage. Now, in amylopectin, it's only the alpha-1,4 bonds that are hydrolyzed by alpha amylase, and the alpha-1,6 bonds are not hydrolyzed by alpha amylase. The next one is glycogen, and that is found in animals, and it's often referred to as animal starch. It's used as glucose storage in the liver and in muscle cells. It's in, in the liver, glycogen supplies glucose in order to maintain blood sugar levels and other needs of the cells. In the muscle, glycogen supplies glucose to muscle cells for conversion into the high energy molecule, ATP. The, this happens when the cells need energy during exercise or work, if you will. We'll talk about that later. Um, I, it doesn't, we don't show it here, but um, you can see, this is a comparison of amylopectin and glycogen. We see there's a lot more branching in the glycogen. Again, we have the alpha-1,4 links between the units, resulting in a flexible chain, and the alpha-1,6 linkages between units resulting in all that branching. So glycogen is much more branched than the amylopectin. Glycogen has up to 1 million glucose units per molecule, and therefore that makes it much larger than the amylopectin. And then we talk about cellulose. And cellulose, this is fibrous and it provides structure in plants and it's one of the most abundant polysaccharides on earth. It forms part of the cell walls in uh, plants, and it prov that, which provides a rigid structure. Each cellulose molecule consists of thousands of glucose units in an unbranched chain. We have beta-1,4 linkages, okay, and this results in a rigid puckered conformation for the molecule. There are microorganisms in the guts of some animals like cows and other grazers, also some insects like termites and moths that produce cellula cellulase, and this hydrolyzes to cellulose, to glucose. We cannot digest cellulose, so humans cannot digest it. Cellulose is what provides the roughage or the insoluble fiber in our diet. We actually use cellulose to build houses and make cardboard and paper products. So some of the derivatives of cellulose are cellophane, uh, the fabric rayon, and so on. If you have any questions on the material, please ask me. Again, focus on the material that I went over in the video. So again, if you have questions, let me know and everybody have a great night.